this. We'll go live. What's up, mediums? Welcome to the writer's journey. I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is the fantabulous Teeling Williams. We're two authors on a journey to learn more about writing with you, the audience. So thank you for joining us. This episode's book spotlight is The Emotion Thesaurus by Becca Puglisi and Angela Ackerman. And tonight we're talking about writing realistic characters. Our guest is the author of the post-apocalyptic post series, Commune. He's an engineer by day and a writer whenever he can fit it in. He's got scores of raving fans who love him dearly, and he probably didn't want me to say that. He is Josh Gayu. Josh, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Gayu. I am people are doing right now. <laughs> That's amazing. We started out with a really long bio, and we got it shorter and shorter and shorter. This was our compromise, kind of like not as long as the original bio, not as short as, as he wanted. But yeah, I forgot I had that thing up. I was I was embarrassed when I saw it written back to me. I thought, oh my god, <laughs> that was so. That was me back when I was like trying to do all the the little check marks that they tell you to do as an author, right? So they're like, oh, you, you got to do this and you must do that. And you must have this web page, and it has to have this this expressive about me, whatever. And I really hate writing uh, about me. So it was the thing you were supposed to do. So it's like, okay, well, that looks about like a a, a quarter bottle worth of whiskey at least to get that written out. So I did I did that, and then I, you know it was the the writing session was kind of me going ah. <laughs> I, I, if, I feel the same way. I, if, I, I read mine every now and then. I'm just like, I really need to update that. Kayleen Williams, born January 25th. Yeah. Night of murder, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I, I wrote up all the crap that they, they tell you you're supposed to. And then uh, she just reminded me today that, that it existed. And I went back and, <laughs> and went, oh, my God. And I just went and deleted it all. Yeah. <laughs> so I wish you thanks would for that. That was useful. Uh, there was there was a lot of cool things, but now they are gone because the most cool thing is that he writes books. Good enough. Found, they're good stories. And that's why you're on the show. So like five months ago, was it five or six? It was a lot of months ago. Steve Bollier from Eighth on Press, he comes to me and he says, you have to have this guy on the show. Josh Gayu is, is writing. It's fantastic. You need to interview him. And I asked him, okay, so we're a topical show. We like to have topics. We like to talk about topics. So what makes yeah. his writing so great? Why, why, why do you love his book so much? And he said, the characters jump off the page. They're so alive. You have to bring them on the show. And, and as a new writer, I want to know how you do it. Because characters, they trip me up when I'm in the middle of the scene and I haven't explored my characters enough. I don't know them, they're not speaking to me, then I stop writing and I totally get stuck. So cool. Katie and I, we're new, new authors. We we brought you on the show because we need to hear from you. <laughs> how you make really great characters, how you make it happen. And uh, you want to share it with YouTube and Facebook and have everyone hear what you have to say. So I mean, if, if, I say, if I say I don't know, do I get booed off the show and... <laughs> no, no, we're gonna we're gonna reach yeah. into your brain. Wait, no, you're over here. No, your brain not... mess, and we're gonna dig out all the information. So that's what we do. In your particular case, when when you say you you don't know where the characters at or if they're not speaking to you and you get stuck, um, I mean, it's just it, my first instinct is to ask: Is that character necessary? Oh, that's a very good question. Do they do they need to be there if they're not? I mean, I mean, if the character isn't fun for you to write, or if there's not some connection that you have, then then it's going to be like that. You're either going to get stuck, or you're going to write something that that's dishonest mm -hmm. uh, emotionally, you know. And um, when it, whenever and I, you know, that happens to me. I'm, I'm uh, you know, kind of working on a character, and I don't know who what it is yet. I just know that I need something there to to help something to happen. But you have to populate that with somebody. You can't just have, you know, cardboard cut out here. Um, so I, I'll kind of stop and, and like re-engineer the damn thing from the ground up if I have to. Uh, or it's questions like that. It's like, all right, well, if, if this person isn't doing it for me and they're inserted into a spot where, where somebody needs to be here making things happen, could I do it with somebody else? 
it, it's it's either that or I got to find something about this one person that that makes them enjoyable to me or compelling to me. Um, and <laughs> you know, I like whatever, that. yeah, whatever, you, that, whatever you, that is, it's it's going to be different uh, for the given situation. But that's that that's like the first thing I want to ask in in that situation. That's it, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you're good. <laughs> I was to say that's a really good point. I mean, if you're getting stuck on a character, especially a scene, um, yeah, definitely asking yourself: Is the character even necessary? Especially if the scene's needed, you know. And it could be as simple as you know adding an extra quirk to him or something. Something that so, something makes him makes them fun, more interesting, you know, fun for you. Uh, you you as as the person who's creating the story, you should be in love with just about every part of it. Uh, and, and I don't mean that the writing of it should be a joy the entire way through, because it, it is not. It's, there's, there's parts that are a real slog. There's certain things that we just don't enjoy writing, but the story needs it mm -hmm. uh, for the story to be complete. So you got to work through that. Um, but overall, uh, each, each person in the story, you should be able to look at and say, you know, at least one thing for yourself. Where you, you know, I like I like the way I did that. And if if that's if at least that is not happening for you, then your reader is going to have that loss when when they're in the story. There's not going to be anything they can grab onto because there's nothing you could grab onto. So, like that that makes me start to ask fundamental questions about what I'm doing, uh, what 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 the character is, what the composition is, what's going on in their head, psychology, and it's like there's got to be some way to make it work. Uh, or reshuffle, recast. Um, oh, and then in the meantime, I'll also say that um, you you too may be aware of certain jargon in the industry, like uh, mm -hmm. vocabulary that's used in the writing business. I'm not going to have any idea what that means because uh, I'm not really, I, I mean, I never went to writing school. I didn't really have a writing degree in college or any of that. It's, everything's kind of self-taught, so... But Josh, that's awesome because that's most of our audience. You know, most yep. of our audience doesn't know these terms yet. We're still learning them. Yeah. Uh, so today we're talking about characterization. Um, so characterization is just making your character come alive. Often. Oh, no, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, for so, those who don't. <laughs> those who don't, yeah. Um, you know, your character okay, start. <laughs> <laughs> can be a round character, so they can have multiple sides yeah. to them. They can be a flat character, so they only have one side to them. They could be a static character that doesn't change throughout the book. They could be a character that's dynamic that does change throughout the book. You know, these are different kinds mm -hmm. of characters that you might want. Um, and then to, to characterize your character, uh, you can do it directly and indirectly. So directly would be the narrator tells the reader exactly what this person's like. Um, Jack was a bore. Uh, or indirectly, you can show what the character is like um, by what the things, by how they look by the things that they think, what they say, how they act on others uh, to show that he's a bore rather than just saying that he's a bore. So guys, throughout this episode, we're gonna be using those terms, characterization, um, direct and indirect characterization and character development. Now, how's character development a little different from characterization? Uh, well, for me, the, the development is just the, it's the growth that the, the person has to go through during the story. Um, it, it's like you were talking uh, earlier when you have static characters that don't really change or you have characters that do change through the story. Um, all of that for me is kind of, I, I choose what I need based on the story that I'm trying to write. Uh, like for me, the, the process, I, I know it's going to be different for everybody, but for me, the process, the first thing I'm trying to figure out when I want to write something is, is uh, what, what is the one idea that's going to be paramount to the story that I'm trying to convey to uh, the reader, uh, and, and it's going to be something simple. It's it's not going to be this this big, complex thesis. It's really just really easy. Um, and like for commune, uh, I was just talking to a classroom full of kids about this today. Yeah. I feel like I'm repeating myself. Uh, in the commune, repeat stories, all the things. Yeah, right. In the commune stories, uh, the idea for me was um, I wanted to deal with a story where you had like large groups of people that were interacting and uh, you know, there was going to be conflict because it's a post apocalyptic story. We don't write these books to have people uh, take tea together. So 
I wanted there to be no bad guys. There, you know, there's there's like kind of side characters and minor characters that are bad guys throughout the story, but I keep losing the, the audience chat. Okay, never mind. I don't care. Um, so mm -hmm. you, it, 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 there's people that show up throughout the story that are bad, but the main characters, the ones that are that I'm most concerned with dealing with, none of them are really bad. I don't think so. Uh, and it was it was a lot of things to me these books, but it was I also kind of used it as a as a mirror to what I see every day, um, just people interacting right on social media. And how it's it's you, you see people getting really wound up and wanting to tear each other's heads off, but it's mm -hmm. usually just over a misunderstanding, right? Or or some stupid comment that somebody's made somewhere, and we're okay. We get out the pitchforks, you know. And I yeah, I I you know spent years kind of watching that behavior and observing it and thinking, okay, so what if I take just normal people that have now kind of been uh, conditioned by this world that we live in with all the social media and the devices and everything. You get rid of all that crap, but then you take them and you kind of just stick them into a, an ugly situation. And mm -hmm. now watch people who have evolved this way and just, just see what they do. And, uh, you know, I, I think in a lot of cases I could have gone really dark, but I preferred to see people behaving better towards each other. But then there were a lot of cases where I could have, you know, had a, had a nice happy ending, but, uh, I had to show some of the darker sides of things. So it was just, the commune, so, was, it was a playground for me, <laughs> you know? So, and so, then throughout that book, the, the progression of the plot and the characters has to be tied together. Right. Um, so you've got an idea and now you figure, okay, what are the pieces and places that I need to put, uh, into the situation to kind of illustrate the point. And then you figure out what kind of character types you want. And this, I've kind of followed a different practice for every book like commune. It was really like casting a movie, right? Like I need, I need this character. I need the military guy and I need the stupid despot guy and I need this guy and I need that. But then once I kind of had those little pieces, they look like little barely carved wooden figurines with like no features and, and you know, nothing's going on. They're really boring. And then you stick them down and you figure out who they are. Um, the first thing you never do is think of them as character hmm. as person that's a guy that's a woman that's a kid they got a history so what was their history what history promotes the the creation of the person you need them to be at the start of the story who do you need them to be when the mm -hmm. whole thing kicks off and then okay what are all the the effects in your life that get you to there and it doesn't have to be everything you don't have to be able to script out every little birthday but there should be major milestones that leave them up to this point that you know about very well because you're going to refer to that later. It's like part of your toolbox. When your character, your person's having an inner monologue or something, you want to have points in history that you can refer back to over and over again that reinforces this idea that, that this is a person. This is somebody who's been through stuff. It wasn't just, here's day one of the story, and they go, and then they just go off and start doing stuff. It's like they've had a whole run of events up to this point and you get them right here and this is just like flat this is who they are and then uh you know things happen in the story uh the character learns things and then through that process the audience learns things with the character they learn things about the character they learn things about the story and the world they're in uh, they learn things about how the character processes problems and deals with them and then they learn things about themselves because they're telling them, well, how would I behave in that situation? What would I do? And that starts going in there. And then they start arguing with your character and saying, you're doing the wrong thing. It's all that stuff that makes people really annoyed. That's good. It's like you want it. And then, you know, at some point, once they've, you know, solved problems and they've grown, there's another line up here. That's the end point where you need them to be. And wherever you need them to be is, is whatever serves the story. It serves the idea that you're trying to tell. So everything is in service to that. And then anything that you stack on top of it is just layers to go from like this little unshapen carved piece of crap wood block to something that looks like what you'd want to show off to someone at some point. See, that's, Here's gonna, mud, yeah? I would say that that's, that's actually a, a really good way to think about it. You know, um, so many people are trapped on this you know, idea, I need, I need unique things. I need unique characters, unique storyline. But what you're saying is, you know, you take the super basic, the military guy, 
the crazy pop star girl, the, um, the drooly face, snot nosed kid. You know, you, you plop them there. You have your, you know, the world that they're going to be in. And then from there, you can go, okay, this is where I need them to be. This is where they're going. What sort of paths would they have to get them mm -hmm. to, you know, the the plane that you're talking mm -hmm. about, the start point of the story yeah. that can actually maybe help or even um, be a detriment to themselves in the story going forward. And I like that. That's you know, you, you give them a, a classic trope, as it were, you know. Well, the, for a book like Commune, you have to because people are just expecting to see it. So but you, you, it's but yeah, but that is a great thing to use in any story a, a little love story. You know, the rich guy who lives in a penthouse and and the poor girl who always has to do the mopping. Yay! Well, it, it, and then you build them up from there and make them new. It depends on the story you want to tell, though. Like, I wouldn't always do well, that. Yeah. For, for the commune series, you got like a post-apocalyptic story, which has been done to death, you know? Uh, so for me, I'm trying to find a way to, to give it something new, or at least give it what I think would be new. Um, and so I knew, kind of writing that, that, okay, people are going to expect to see these archetypes. So I'm not going to try to sidestep them or, or outthink them. I'm just going to give it to them, because that's what they're looking for. But then... The archetypes are going to be different in certain ways that are very fundamental to the actual story. So mm -hmm. you get kind of your your typical bad guy. Uh, but then as the story progresses, you start to feel like, oh, maybe he's not so bad. He, he actually doesn't seem bad at all. You get your typical good guy, you know, the the strong man, silent type drifter. And, and, and you think at first it's like, oh, he's he's wonderful and he's going to protect us all. And, and then as the story progresses... It, you start to kind of think, okay, is he as, as good as we thought he was? Um, and for me, what was really interesting about the book was how the readers responded to it. Mm -mm. Because I, I wrote certain people uh, what I thought was a certain way, thought it would be interpreted a certain way. And then it was very interesting to see how people would latch on to their specific heroes. And if you talk to any group of people about this book, they all have different ideas on who they think the real hero is, which is what I wanted. Right. Uh, so I, I kind of feel like I, I, I got that one. Uh, I was happy with that. But then the next book I did after that, it was a, it was a hard science fiction book that I wanted to do about what I thought um, if, if artificial intelligence actually like emerged like the real thing where the machine becomes conscious. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write a book about what that looked like and then what that meant afterwards right and the kind of problems that you're dealing with uh and and i didn't like there wasn't like this big cast and i wasn't going with uh typical uh character types it, i just i don't know for that book it just seemed like i knew who needed to be in it before i was even thinking about it so i was thinking more in terms of well okay there, there's this engineer who uh, <laughs> engineer mm -hmm. you notice how like 50 percent of stephen king's uh characters are always writers i'm wondering as i go forward if that's going to be a thing with me Ah. See, but you're still using the, you know, that, that block method where they have a basic role, you know, they have a definitive part in the story, be it the engineer. Oh, sure. Yeah. The, I, yeah. I get what so, you're saying there. What it, the, I mean, the, what I'm saying is that when I, when I was writing that book, I didn't conceptualize it that way. I was very aware of it for the commune series for this. It was, it was very different because uh, like a lot of times I'll do this in books. Um, I'm sure it's a valid technique, but I just call it cheating. It's when I just take people out of my life and stick them in a book, you know? I, I completely think that that is you a valid, that. valid you use, not that. cheating at all. Yeah. I, I, I <laughs> it think feels it, like cheating. It really does. <laughs> I, yeah, no, it does. It, it really seems because, you know, your, your readers will respond to that because that's, that feels real, right? Because you've taken a real person and basically transposed them onto the page. Uh, the most popular character in, in all of my books, this uh, Marine Gibbs, isn't really anybody that I dreamt up so much. It's just a buddy that I work with every day. Yeah. And and he pretty much knows it, too. And he just kind of smiles at everybody because they're like, oh, this this wonderful guy. And he's like, yeah, you don't want to know me in real life. <laughs> but he, you know, because he's, you know, he's your typical crass Marine. I love well, the guy, though. <laughs> this kind of answers the question I had. Um, do you make up your character's are, are they are they part of you like are they different aspects of you that you're kind of like giving voice to every or character kind that, of seem like a people watcher an observer who's kind of like looking at the people around you and and putting them into your book 
every character that you ever write is going to have a PCU in them. Always. Um, I've written books with rapists in them, and there was a piece of me in that rapist. Hmm. And that's just something you're going to have to get used to. It was really hard for me to write my first book because there's a rape scene in it. And mm -hmm. I thought long and hard about including that in the book because I thought, oh, Christ, the rape scene. It's always in the goddamn post-apocalyptic books. There's always the woman that gets. And I, and I really wrestled with writing that because I didn't want to go there if I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. But I thought if I, if I flinch away from that, that's BS because that's the kind of stuff that happens. When, when the rules go away and the protections are gone, the people who are physically weaker are going to get abused. And we see it in, in every country right now that doesn't have a, a stable system of protections in government. Hmm. So I thought, okay, I got I to gotta deal with this. And then I wrote it, and it was the hardest thing to write that I've ever done. Hmm. You know, I, I remember after I finished up that chapter, I, re I remember I was sitting in the downstairs room of my condo when I wrote the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I was done, my hands were shaking. <laughs> Like it was really, it was really bad. Uh, and then, you know, <laughs> you put the book out and people say, oh, geez, he, just, he put the post-apocalyptic or AC in the book and they get all angry at you. They get upset. <laughs> but that, but that brings up a good, a good, um, I don't want, I want to say call it an issue, but a, some, something that I see some writers run into is um, the characters that are difficult to write. Not necessarily that they might not be needed. They might really need to be needed, but mm -hmm. either their personality is something so far away from what they're comfortable with. Their choices are so far away from what they're comfortable with. What sort of um, the main advice or, <laughs> or tricks you could give our, our viewers as far as um, being able to tackle those characters that you know you need to have, but they're not necessarily, you know, as close to you as you, well, obviously rapist, yes. you definitely want to be close to that, but. <laughs> well, but uh, again, you you got to find something there to to connect with if you're going to write it honestly. Um, if if there is something wrong with you mentally, that is helpful when you're trying to do this stuff. And I'm I'm not. <laughs> it sounds like I'm joking. I'm really. We're not. all a little uh, crazy. It's okay. Uh, yeah. You. I mean. For, for anything that you write, you, 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 you've got to find some way to connect to it and enjoy it some, somehow. Even when you're writing the horrible shit. Or even when you're writing a horrible person, there's, there's got to be something there. Um, I, uh, you know, un, unless you're doing something uh, just, just for fun. Like you want to have the, the obvious over-the-top mustache twirling bad guy. You know? That's really easy to do. It's like I, I could I could write that guy in five minutes. He gets up in the morning. The first thing he has is a box of kittens by his bed. He takes one out and he steps on his head. And then he goes to the shower and he bathes in the blood of baby seals. And the first thing he does when he steps out the door is he commits three hate crimes against the first three minorities he can find. That's simple. It's also boring. <laughs> like I don't I don't care about that guy. I know he's ridiculous. Um, you, you need a complex character. You know, you, you need you need something there. Even if you're writing a son of a bitch, there needs to be like one redeeming value in there somewhere. There's got to be. Nobody who was ever evil thought they were evil. So if you write them knowing they're evil, it's already wrong. You, you know, Ooh, you, that you is gotta, a good piece of advice. Screwed it up. <laughs> yeah. Hitler, when you're writing I, evil people, look, don't Hitler, go out of the gate thinking they're evil. Hitler, like it. Absolute mass murdering evil son of a bitch. Right. He thought he was right. He did. He thought yeah. he was doing the right thing. Yeah. So I, I mean, that like you don't, you, you don't want to be able to think like that, but you got to be able to understand it. Mm -hmm. so, so you got to wh whoever it is you're dealing with. I mean, we all love to write heroes because they're easy. They, you know, they they do the thing you're supposed to do. But you gotta, you gotta be able to put your head in a sick place and go to a sick place, and still have something you can connect to when you're doing it. Now, how do you, you don't strike me as a person who, who's sick. Actually, I've been um, following you on Facebook, you know, in, in your, um, in your fun time group. <laughs> and actually, you strike me as a very moral person. Um, so how do you, how do you navigate that? Um, being true to your characters, letting them be who they are, um, letting them be natural, letting them do what they're, they're going to do. But 
um, you still don't think they are right and what they're doing is right. Like how, how do you balance story and plot and character development? How do you, how do, you do that? Uh, okay. Um, big question. <laughs> I can, so I can tell you how I do it and I don't know if it's going to be helpful to you at all. That's fine. Let's hear it. It's like a mental exercise. Uh, you, you just, you, you have to exist with, with, uh, like a kind of mental doubleness. Hmm. where there's there's a part of you the you know the adult side the the higher side that understands that the things that you're describing on the page are despicable and and or if you're writing something of that nature right um mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm thinking of specific things that i've written that were uh you know they i i felt personally they were necessary for a story but uh, and i think also given the setting certain atrocities are more uh, accepted than others. If I write a story where it starts out as a love, as a love story, right? There's a, a, a guy and a girl. They meet each other on the streets of New York. They go together into a cafe for a couple of times. They have some coffees and they learn about each other. The girl, uh, she's, she's a marketing executive for some company. She's the youngest one that was ever uh, hired at the company to do this job. And this guy's just a musician. He's trying to get onto his feet, but they have something about each other that they like, and they really connect. They have like one of their last coffees before they're going to go on a real date. Right. Then they step out of the, the cafe and they're murdered horribly by a psychopath running down the street with an ax. That would be awful. <laughs> I don't, I don't want that in that story, right? That's unacceptable. Like, I'm, I'm not going to accept it. It's like, as, as the audience, I read that and say, this, this person's an idiot, right? <laughs> Unless we're going to take the story this direction. But if the intent of the story, the expressed intent was, hey, I'm going to tell you a love story. And then I put an axe murder in it. I'm kind of a dick. So there's, there's like this, this contract that you're entering into with your reader, right? In commune, it's kind of understood in this kind of setting. There's going to be awful things that happen. But it's so funny to me that I put those awful things on the page and like most of my readers, they, they, they see it and they get the context of what's happening and they go, yeah, <laughs> you know, because they like who it's happening to, or they think that the, that the action was just in my book, you guys know what uh, degloving is. Yeah. De you know what a degloving is? I think so. Degloving is if you cut a line around your skin right here. Get your fingers under it and pull the skin off. It's like you know that scene in Terminator. I had a scene in a book where one character was going to deglove another, and because of who was involved and the stakes and and the situation, everybody was disappointed that the degloving did not happen. <laughs> so that's another that's another good point you've you've raised is when writing your characters you do also need to keep in mind the type of story that you're writing what genre oh, yeah. are you going into um what sort of tropes do you want to have in there i mean that can definitely weigh in on um the types of people that you have in there yeah because you certainly wouldn't want to have an axe murderer running around a <laughs> gorgeous love story that's supposed to end happily ever after <laughs> unless i had a really good reason yeah i mean that's the other thing about this stuff uh, you know i don't any, any of the rules that I know about writing, first of all, they're not rules. They're just suggestions. Mm -hmm. But any of these rules, I just kind of picked up from reading other books. It's like I said, I never went to a, to a school to, to learn how to do this or took, uh, you know, like creative writing courses or whatever. I, I'd rather just be writing. I don't want to be in a class doing it. But uh, all, all of that... You, you start to pick up rules. You start to know how things work. You get an idea of what does work and what doesn't. But then the, the thing that's the most fun for me is once I kind of get a handle on that, I like to see how far I can bend or break those rules and still have it be accepted by the audience. Um, and, you know, sometimes it works. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't. And they really let you know about it. But it, I, it's it's fun for me. Uh, I, 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 get, I get nervous or suspicious when I... If I talk to a writer and they say, I know how to write a book and I'm going to tell you how to do it. And if you follow these steps, your book's going to come out great, just like mine. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, if, you, if you're just going to write the same old thing that you've been writing or, or, or you know, churn out the same stuff, then, yeah, that, that formula probably works. You know, Hollywood has shown us that it works plenty until it doesn't. But if you're, if you're really trying something, 
uh, you know, you, you probably, you shouldn't know if it's going to work or not. And it should scare the hell out of you. Mm. And I don't, I don't know if this is the same for everybody because I don't know what it's like for other people to write books, but when I'm working on something and it's like, I'm nervous about it. Like, I, I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, if I put it out there and I, I have no idea if people are going to accept it to go, what the, what were you thinking? Uh, that feels like I'm doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of what gets me excited. If, if I'm not feeling that, then I get, I, then I get really nervous because then I think, Oh God, <laughs> what am I doing? I'm, I'm just, I'm wasting my time here. Uh, I will say you Excuse are not me. alone because I, I've felt that probably for every short story I have submitted good I've, I've i was just like god this is like the worst piece of no one's gonna understand anything that i just did and none of it matters but yeah no if, if the repeated theme that we're getting is like to have fun with your yep. characters and to have fun with your story and part of that fun is that uncertainty well you should you should um the best writing is is when you're being as honest as you can it's when when you're writing the truest thing you can and that, you know, that's also the perfect advice for breaking writer's block. Uh, Hemingway figured it out years ago. So how do you deal with writer's block? He said, I sit down and I try to write one sentence. It's the truest sentence I can write. And if I can get that out, then I try to write another sentence after that. And I try to make that the truest sentence I can write. And everything that you write, you can write it very true. Even if it's fantasy, even if it's nonsense. Even if all the characters have fairy wings coming off their back and they ride magic horses, you can still write it so that it's true. And if you if you do that, you're you're doing things that expose you and they make you vulnerable. And you're probably telling the reader more things about yourself than you'd like them to know. And you have to do that anyway. It's really scary, but it's that's that's when you're going to do your best stuff always. Hmm. All right. Well, I did a little bit of spy work and asked a couple of your fans what makes your characterization so strong. Oh, and we're going to look at some particular it's be all the cursing. I know it. Aspects of of character development that's that are in Josh's story, but also that we can use in our books too. But first, we're going to hear about the book of the week from Kaylee. Oh, yes. All right. This episode's book of the week spotlight is The Emotion Thesaurus, a writer's guide to character expression by Becca, forgive me, Puglisi and Angela Ackerman. The best-selling emotion thesaurus often hailed as the gold standard for writers and credited with transforming how writers craft emotion has now been expanded to include 55 new entries. One of the biggest struggles for writers is how to convey emotion to readers in a unique and compelling way. When showing our characters feelings, we often use the first idea that comes to mind and they end up smiling, nodding, frowning too much. If you need inspiration for creating characters, emotional responses that are personalized and evocative, this ultimate show don't tell guide for emotion can help. It includes body language clues, thoughts, and visceral responses for 130 emotions that cover a range of intensity from mild to severe, providing <laughs> innumerable options for individualizing a character's reactions, <gasps> a breakdown of the biggest emotion related writing problems and how to overcome them, advice on what should be done before drafting to make sure your character's emotions will be realistic and consistent. Instruction for how to show hidden feelings and emotional subtext through dialogue and nonverbal cues. And much more! The Emotion Thesaurus is the Emotion Thesaurus is an easy to navigate list format. It will inspire you to create stronger, fresher character expressions and engage readers from your first page to your last. Bye. Click now. We okay. thought it would be a good match for today's episode, so. You guys are way too fun. I want to come back and do this again. <laughs> Yay! We love it when we hear no. that. I'll, I'll ruin Dance that. for the fun. Hey, Dance can you hear fun. me okay? Can you both hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you great. You're, okay, you're that, slightly I'm... quiet, but. Oh, am I? I, I can hear you. Do I pull my mic closer? Is this better? <laughs> can you okay. hear me now? I, you guys sound great. And um, In fact, we can hear you so well that we heard you two weeks ago in your Facebook group. 
when you said, oh, they think we're coming on, I'm coming on to talk about characterization, but actually I'm coming on <laughs> <laughs> for your super duper fun time, awesome shit boss, <laughs> which only stops for tacos. And Kayleen, do you, do you have something over there? You know, oh, I kind of <laughs> do. Oh, wait, can we say, oh, yeah. And look at that. I, I, I might have one too. Oh, look at that deliciousness. <laughs> Don't you have one, Josh? With your no, taco I truck? Didn't, I didn't bring any tacos. I'm what? sorry. <laughs> just a little off the cuff. I didn't realize I was committing to a bit. <laughs> you but, cannot yeah. escape us. So well, you, you can stop for tacos. We've got them right here. Outstanding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But first, Kaylee, we got to pray real quick. Okay, I'm going to pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this day, for this food, and I pray that you bless it and the tacos and the podcast and everyone listening. In your name, amen. Woo! Tacos! No Taco way. Thursday. <laughs> oh, are we eating it? Are we taking bites? Oh, <laughs> well, you better, man. You got a taco. You got on the show. <laughs> you can't let a taco unbitten, man. That's that's like sacrilege. All right. Really? You just said there a you blessing go. over it. Eat the taco. You guys are welcome out there in the live feed. <laughs> For those of you listening <laughs> on on um, the audio, you just missed amazing tacos and Lauren and I stuffing our faces. That's they what's happening really right good. now. They look uh, really good. So I'm going to mute this while I chew my food. <laughs> All right. So I did talk to um, Steve Bollier and Brian Menser about what makes your writing so awesome. And okay. I got a lot of great feedback. Um, good guys. Yeah, I know, and they love you a lot. They don't charge much for me for to, uh, to say these things about me either. It's like <laughs> I think Steve is forty bucks, and Brian's only at twenty right now. So Steve said, "Amazing dialogue, dude has amazing dialogue." And go talk to Brian because Brian can explain things really well. <laughs> <laughs> and then Brian said, um, "The characters each have their own voice." Let the characters remain true to their personality and moral compass or lack thereof. Um, Steve also said, you don't worry about word count. Um, whether or, whether that's, I don't know. I It's probably because I usually end up writing long stories. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's good. Um, and then I was curious about how do you describe characters' physical appearance? Like some, some authors, they... Um, I don't. I I think maybe go overboard, like in an effort to describe yeah, detail, good, and then good, other good. authors don't know how to do it at all. And then internal monologue and how characters react and to each other and influence each other. I think those are kind of the big pieces of characterization that I was hoping we could cover today. Sure. Uh, well, so there's there is the technical side of this, and then the more esoteric. Okay. Technical. Um, there's there's little. Uh, tools and tricks that you can remind yourself as you're going through it. For me, uh, like a, a physical description, if I'm going to go to the trouble to do a physical description on a character, uh, it's, it, it's, it's as brief as I can make it, you know, it, uh, less is more when, when you're doing this stuff. Uh, I, I try to, to get just the shadow of a sketch going in your mind and then step away. And I don't really want to describe all that crap ever again i want to land on one characteristic to hold on to for that person and for me it's always kind of like that that one there's a rule of one with me uh pick one thing uh so for the character it, you know it, it, it depends too the the bigger the cast the more um distinct you need these idiosyncrasies to be the smaller the cast, you can kind of calm down a bit, not worry about it so much because you're not going to be fighting with uh, trying to keep everybody straight and in their lane. Uh, so like for my Jake character, at, at first I spent a lot of time just kind of getting them set in your mind so he's he looks a certain way. Well, and then also he goes through a physical transformation through the story. So there's two times that he has to be um, sort of presented to the audience. And I, I kind of treated him as a new character when I did it, the first time he was, he was kind of normal looking, very average. He's kind of got long shaggy hair and he was not very well kept. And I spent more time dealing with uh, his, his presence than his appearance. It's like this silence and stillness that he has. Uh, and then there's, there's like this kind of fracture for the reader. 
because when he's first introduced in the series, it's at the end. It's, at, it's like after most of everything's happened. And he's like this big, hulking, muscle-bound creature at this point. And so that's the first time he's introduced to you. And it's like, okay, that's who this is. Big, nasty, right? And then the next two books are talking about stuff that happened like a couple of years ago. So now we're going back a couple of years and he doesn't look like that. Now he's just like a thin guy and he's, he looks kind of normal. Um, his, his presence, his behavior is more disturbing than his, his physical appearance. And then uh, after that, the, the books themselves are a process of bringing his physical appearance to match his inner self, Right. So he's, in his presence, imposing and disturbing at the start of the stories, but he doesn't look that way. When you get to the end, the, everything is there. It, it, it's all what he's shaped himself into. But I'm not spending a bunch of time beating you over the head over, you know, here's how he looks when he walks into the room. And it's just certain people interact with him in different ways. And I like to do it so that it's another character observing it in him than just saying it about him, right? Or her. Uh, I don't I don't want to have a woman come into a room and then just start writing about whatever. Let's let's say she's incredibly attractive, or let's say she's frumpy, muscular, thin, whatever. I don't want to just start describing what this is for you. I want to take you, put you inside another observer in that room, and let you observe them through that person's eyes. So the, there's two levels of characterization happening. There's the focus, right? And then there's the camera that I've put you in over here. But now because you're in this person's point of view, you have access to everything that's going on in their head too. Hmm. So you will be introduced to this person. You'll have your own ideas about how they look based on what I'll share with you. But then you'll also be hearing about what the observer that you're sitting inside of is thinking about them. So you find ways to get all these different facets of this person in kind of a big package and it doesn't feel like overkill it doesn't feel really wordy because you can do these things with maybe a couple of paragraphs and like a little smattering of sentences you're not spending a lot of time doing this you're picking the one right thing to say about mm -hmm. this person at the right moment that says as many things as you can as you as, as you can right it's like killing multiple birds with one stone can you think of any examples off the top of your head? Uh, well, so like I was talking about with Jake, uh, when in the second book, and Jake is like the kind of, kind of the protagonist of the commune series, uh, you're introduced to him twice, the first book and then the second book, there's this other group of people that run into him. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I want Jake to be a mystery. I, I don't want to describe anything from his perspective at all. So any characterization you get of Jake is through other characters' eyes. So you've got this Gibbs guy, a Marine. Excuse me. you got this Gibbs guy he's, who's a Marine, and uh, he's got a gun drawn on Jake, and Jake is not behaving in any of the ways that he wants him to, the way people should behave to make uh, the Marine feel comfortable in the situation. If you're holding a gun on someone, you want them to be agitated. You want them to behave like a human. That that means, okay, I know who you are. I can predict you. That's all characterization is. It's giving your audience the ability to predict behaviors from the character before the character does them. If they can do that, it makes them really happy because it tells them I'm mastering this material, right? I, I know who this person is. And then if the character does something that they're not expecting at all, uh, that can be wonderful or it can be terrible. The thing is, you, you have to give them a reason for the character to take this left turn. Right. Uh, some, something that works within the framework of the story, something that works within the character's own psychology. And if you have that waiting for them to, to give it to them once they've done it, uh, they get really excited because then it's like, oh, I've, I've unlocked a mystery, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the best thing about, oh, well, let me, let me finish my point earlier and then we'll get on to the next thing i'm uh, this right uh so <laughs> i don't i don't know uh okay so i know just got, hurry it up have a taco waiting no i'm kidding no just eat it man just go so uh so gibbs has the, the rifle on him and he wants him to behave behave agitated because that means he's human and and jake doesn't behave like that he's very calm he he doesn't seem to care and through the entire situation jake is behaving as though he's the one who's in control even though they restrain him, they got a gun on him. He's he's acting like he's the guy in charge, and they're doing everything he wants him to. And that makes Gibbs 
the Marine character, very nervous because he doesn't like feeling like somebody's got one up on him, right? So everything you're learning about Jake right now isn't something I have to tell you or isn't something Jake's telling you. It's just Gibbs and the way he's behaving with this guy. And you don't even really need to give that much of Gibbs' inner monologue. Just give certain bits of dialogue that shows he's not doing well right now and, and you know, he's, you know, make him really twitchy and agitated. Then in the meantime, there's another uh, character in the scene who's kind of like a Marine fanboy. He, oh, I want to be a Marine, right? And he's running around Gibbs trying to just impress him all the time and, and, and be his little gopher. So you've got him looking at Jake and then looking at how he's making Gibbs behave. So now there's, there's that extra bit of, oh, well, if he's making him act like that and that's my hero, I need to really hate him. And, and you know, you start getting all these uh, opportunities that start presenting themselves with the way people interact. Uh, every interaction between characters, it's an opportunity. It should be solving something. It should be teaching you something about how the person thinks or, or what's going on in here, what they're likely to do in a situation. If any of your dialogue isn't doing that, it's a waste of dialogue. It's, it's got, even, even if it's really simple, like somebody asks for a response and all the character says is, yeah, that yeah should be written in a way that it means something for that person. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's the truth. Um, no, there's, there's, there's so many times where, where dialogue, you just, you, you read it and you're just like, really, would they say that? Does that need to be said? So yeah, it, well, for, for me, everything is, is really just like this idea of tempo, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, can I, can I do one thing narratively in the story and have it only accomplish one thing? Okay. That's all right. I would rather do one thing and have it accomplish two or three things. I would rather have that one thing that I wrote, uh, give you an idea of setting, give you an idea of dynamics between people, give you an idea of what somebody's thinking inside their head. You can do that with one sentence. It's gotta be the right sentence, but you can do it. And if you do it a lot of times, uh, you can say a lot with very little. And anybody who read my commune series would say, well, this doesn't sound like that writer at all. Because he's the wordiest son of a bitch I've ever seen. <laughs> Those books get wordy. <laughs> Brian Manser did not say that. Uh, I, I think they do. I think there's there's parts where it's like I would go back and, and do a lot of stuff differently now. But you can't. You just Like the books are out there and there's a lot of people that, that really love them the way they are. Mm -hmm. So if I went back and tried to screw with them, they'd probably, you know, stake me. So that actually brings up another question. How has your development of character changed from when you first started writing to what you're writing now? Uh, I'm, I'm mostly, I'm just looking for ways to do more with less. Uh, the, the less I can say on a subject uh, in a book, I, it, it seems to me the better it is. And it's, it's, because when, when you're when you're limited to when you try to limit yourself to saying less, uh, you really have to make the words that you're putting on the page count. Um, so I think that my like my writing, um, and this is intentional. I've done this on purpose, uh, mostly because I want the books to have a different feel. Mm. Uh, each each different book I do, I want it to feel different. And one of the ways I do that is by changing the the voice of the writing whether it be uh, the way that I write narratively or the way characters tend to talk or the way they interact with each other, the way I, uh, you know, punctuate dialogue or so forth. Um, I, I try to have a different feel in every book so that you could read a, a, you know, just some random paragraph on it and know, oh, that was him when he was writing commune or that's what he, when he did the robot book or, or whatever. Uh, and, a, and a part of that for me is, yeah, it's like if I can find a way to cut out all the extra fat, mm. cut out all the bullshit where it's just, you know, if I can say something with two words, but I can break your heart, mm. that's what I'm looking for. You made so many good points. I don't know which one to pick up on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But the well, one I, I, <laughs> there was something that I was going to say earlier because the, it, uh, there was a question that kind of sparked this in my head. And I don't even know what I'm responding to anymore, but I, I know I had this in there. It was just that the, the thing that I like about characters and writing stories and everything is that it's a collaborative process with your audience. And it, it doesn't seem like it can be that way because it's fixed text on a page and the book is only ever like that when you write it. 
but that's actually not the case. And I found that the like if if you find out the right things to withhold from the audience, whether that's description of what they look like or certain details in the story, like for me, I don't like giving definite answers. And it's not because I have a hard time uh, figuring out what the ending of the story is. I know what the ending of the story is before I start writing the damn thing. Every book that I write, I know exactly what the ending is. I know exactly what happened. Um, it's not like there's things that I'm leaving open because I, I don't know how to solve that problem. I know every little event that happens in, in these books. But the problem is every time you get a story from someone that's secondhand, it's been corrupted. Right. Even when the story is coming from me to the reader, what the reader is experiencing is not what I wrote. Right. It's I've I had one idea in my head and one right. sense set of images or movies in my head. And that's what I wrote. And then I put it out there. And, you know, my job is to do it as honestly as I can make the realest thing that I can for the audience. And then they get their hands on it. But their experience of whatever that is, is completely different from what I was thinking about or what I intended. Uh, so at that point, when they get their hands on the material, whether they like it or not, it's like it's between them and the work. It has nothing to do with me, you know. So when you can leave certain things open for them to fill in, it makes them a part of the story. You know, if uh, if I'm writing a first person narrative from somebody's point of view certain details that they give probably shouldn't be definite because everybody that ever told a story was an unreliable narrator. They get things wrong. So there's omissions that you can leave out. And uh, for me, there's always certain things that I need the reader to figure out in my story. Um, whether it's, you know, little clues or it's a little puzzle here or there, there needs to be something that they're working to solve that I'm not giving them. And it's not, it's not like the critical ending like all the pieces are there for a good story but there's certain things in there that it's like you have to think about actively if you're going to understand what's going on like for for instance in commune the the big secret is who the hell is jake and where is he from what's going on with him nobody knows and everything you need to understand who he is where he came from down to detail is right there in the book and it's just you have to put it together i don't i don't spell it out because that's boring I call those breadcrumbs. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. I've, I've heard people call it that. For me, it just, it seems like I, I hate when everything is spelled out for me. I, I, I like to think about stories. I like to pick them apart and discuss. And I love it when I can talk to somebody else about a story and they have a completely different impression than I do. And then we can talk about that and they can tell me where I'm wrong about something, or I can tell them where I disagree on something. That's, that's the best part of this stuff for so, me so when you're writing a scene you're not necessarily writing exactly what you see and hear like trying to photocopy the experience that you're envisioning onto the page you're trying to create an experience for the reader and let the reader's imagination play that's a part of it yeah how do you figure out what to put in and what to leave out uh well if the you, ultimate question. If you listen to Hemingway, he'll tell you that if you write truly enough, you can leave out anything and the writer, the reader will stick at the point. Wow. But that, you know, that that's, I, I suspect he believed that less than, than you would, you would think. I think he was try, just trying to make a point with that statement. Right. But uh, for me, it's, it's really uh, the, the, the puzzle that I end up putting in, and it's, it's different every time. Sometimes it's a big puzzle. Sometimes it's like little stuff, but for me, like unreliable narration or details in a story that you have to piece together for yourself, that makes it worth the fight and makes it worth the journey. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if you can leave certain things over, or, or if you can leave certain things open, people can kind of choose what their ending was too. Uh, it's like I was saying, if you talk to different people about the commune series, Different, different of those people have a different idea who the hero was, hmm. and they're all right, right? They're like, no, you know, I think it was this. He, this, this was my guy. Like this is the guys. No, no, no. Was, this was the person here. They all have a different idea who who was the best person, who was the the purest protagonist, and they're all right. 
and they're all happy with the answer they got. They're good. good. And there's there's definite uh, uh, beats that that happen in the story that you can't change. But I, you know, for me, I tried to do it where everybody's behavior, if not excusable, was at least understandable. So, you know, that really that that's that's just a, a case by case basis when you're writing a book. It's like I can't give you any rule that says this is what you do and it works every time. Yeah, really. All that happens is the the character must be behaving in a way that conforms to their own psychology. Mm. That's it. As long as you're doing that, it's going to work. Um, and as long as, as that psychology has been set up properly in the writing so that, that people can go back to it and see, oh, yes, this. Then it's going to work. It's like, uh, you know, Game of Thrones, uh, when when Danny went nuts and just nuked the entire city with her with her dragon. There was a reason that was rejected. It wasn't it, it wasn't because people hate Danny as a character. I mean, I guess some people did. I thought she was cool. I liked her. But the reason people revolted against that was because throughout the entire run of the series up to that point, her thing, her her core identity, her principle was I protect the innocent. I protect the weak. I protect slaves, women who couldn't fight for themselves, children who couldn't defend themselves. I am the breaker of their chains. Right. I am their mother. Then she goes to the city and, and having won the battle, having won the war, her idea was, I'm, I'm going to nuke everybody that I just spent all of my formative years trying to defend, even to the detriment of my own goals, of my own desires. She considers her dragons to be her children. She's chaining them up and starving them to keep them from killing these people she's supposed to be protecting. But she'll nuke these ones over here. You needed something to set up that heel turn, right? Mm -hmm. And if you'd have had something, something in that series somewhere that kind of set that up and cemented the idea that, no, she can go this way, then it would have been accepted. People would have been fine with it. Um, and saying that, well, she's just, she's subject to the, uh, you know, the madness of her, of her bloodline. That's bad too. That robs her of agency. That, that makes her a character who, who now has no uh, control uh, with her own destiny. She's just a little pawn that gets moved around so that things can happen. You, everything a character does, even if it, you don't understand it, even if it makes no logical sense, if it conforms to their own psychology, it's, it's going to work. It's good. And See, then, and I, I like that because that, I mean, that's also reiterate, or I guess, uh, making deeper what you're saying earlier about the reader being able to guess what the character is going to do next. Yeah. I love that. You know, well, that's... Your, char your character doesn't have to be this wild out of the box thing, but your reader does need to be able to connect with them in some, some way. And the perfect way is this is what they're going to do. And if well, you deliver that and then not deliver it in the right way, <laughs> uh, that could be that's magic. Thing. Well, so readers are a pain in the ass, right? Because <laughs> what they want, they, they want to be shown something new. But, uh, you know, humans love seeing patterns. They, they yeah. love predictive patterns. Yeah. They, they love when you show them A, then B, then C. They love being able to say D and be right. And storytelling is, is that uh, at, its, at its core. It's presenting a person with a series of events. And then there's this thing that you know that's going to happen down the line. We call it a climax. But, you know, it's, it's really just... The, the chief event that we're building to. And you feel that anticipation happening through the story. There is a joy, even if you're watching a horror movie, in knowing that something is coming and having some idea of what it's going to be. But then when they get there and it happens, they want it to be something they haven't seen before. They want to they want to be presented with something that's unique and, and uh, uh, out of the blue. But... If you don't, if you don't show them that it's coming, then they get angry. They feel like it's come out of nowhere, right? You have a payoff without a setup, which is just random nonsense. If you, Ooh, that them, is a good set. I, I'm going to repeat that real quick. Sorry for interrupting you. Oh, okay. Sorry. You need to have a payoff with a setup. I love it. Okay. Great. Yeah. Continue. Well, I don't know. That's that's just kind of like the thing. It's like you need something that sets up the event, and if you're missing that. It starts to make the, the readers angry about the experience, right? So if you have a setup with no payoff, 
what what they're going to think is like things are just being uh, introduced to them with no reason right. and then they start to get bored with that like they say okay well you showed me this thing but it doesn't it doesn't come into play anywhere it means nothing the next thing that you try to show me i'm going to resist it now because i don't know if i'm supposed to care about it or not it, i'm devoting brain cells right now and energy to holding this information in my mind are you going to reward me for doing that or is this exactly. just going to be nothing right yeah. so that's that's like the first cardinal sin and then the second sin is having a payoff without a setup that's that's just random shit happening everywhere <laughs> Right. I have That's, no emotional connection to anything that just happened. Well, ha have you guys ever heard of the movie Rubber? Okay. Um, if you're if you're interested in learning about writing and, and a lot of these more experimental methods of writing, go see the movie Rubber. It's a fantastic film. I love it so much. But like most people would hate the thing because the whole film is just an experiment in patternless storytelling. It's storytelling with zero pattern at all. There's like setups and, and payoffs everywhere that make no sense and have no relation to each other. It's absolute insanity. And it's so fun to watch because it's compelling in one way. But on the other, on the other hand, watching it, you start to understand why all the rules that, that writers have kind of learned to live by, they, they're so important. And it's, it's because like, it, again, like the, the reader, they've got to see it coming. You, you've got to give them just enough so they can see it happening. But then once it happens, you have to present it in such a way where it's it's like this new, unexpected thing. Uh, a, a lot of the writers today, they're trying to do that by subverting expectations, which really means you just do dumb things to trick the audience. You're not trying to convey an idea to the audience. You're not trying to take them on a journey or, or help them to learn through things through what your characters are learning. You're just, you're, you're playing gotcha. You're mm -hmm. trying to trick them. We're not here to trick the audience. That's a waste of our time. <laughs> we're, he we're here to share an idea. Yeah. Right? And the, the most important way you can share an idea is do it in such a way that it's going to be accepted. And if you start doing stupid shit that makes the reader reject the ideas you're trying to share, well, I don't know why we're here anymore. <laughs> it doesn't make any <laughs> sense. So, you know, like uh, for me, uh, when it comes to characters, if I'm going to have a character go off and do something that's completely unexpected there's got to be something there that that explains that it makes it work and i use this as a as an example I, I made this uh this video a while ago about uh just kind of consolidating my ideas about writing mm -hmm. and the example i used was uh you've got oh man this has been an hour are we still going yeah you know, you're good. You're okay. okay all right all right yeah. fine as long so as you're good, you're good. I, I i presented this this kind of experiment where a woman comes home uh, and finds her husband is dead on the floor, right? She has two reactions, okay? You got woman A who falls to her knees and screams and says, oh, my husband, and she picks up the, the phone and she calls for the ambulance, right? Then you have reaction B. The woman uh, screams in happiness. She puts on a little black dress and runs out and she goes clubbing with her girlfriends, okay? So now we have to understand why, why the women are behaving this way in each case, right? So in this case, if she's falling down on her knees and she's she's crying because her husband is dead, I, I would take that to mean, okay, well, that this was a loving relationship. These two were good to each other. They've got this whole history. And over here, something wasn't right. Uh, there was, you know, uh, 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 abuse or, or he was cheating or maybe she was like a black widow type. You know, she, she just wanted the money or, you know, it's it's like got to be one of these things, right? So then I said, okay, now what happens if you take those two personalities and swap them? So the one who comes home and falls down on her knees for her husband's death is the one that was being abused or the one who actually wanted him to die. What if she poisoned him? But this is how she's behaving now. What about over here? The woman who loved her husband, who was crazy about him and had this wonderful life with him. What if when she found him dead, she put on a dress and went out clubbing with her girlfriends? Can you explain that behavior? So the trick is, that's that's this other pattern that you're allowing to emerge right mm -hmm. so you've got the first pattern on top which is a woman has come in her husband's dead right there what's she going to do and then the then the audience goes oh okay you know i'm, I'm expecting a few different reactions then she's going to do one okay all right this is what this relationship is now okay they're loving they love each other or whatever but then 
Right after that, you introduced them this idea that this is the woman who poisoned him. Now they're... Why? Right? What the fuck is going but on? Then, yeah, but then if you can fill in the details after that that explain why she poisoned him. And then you fill in a little bit more backstory and you see that at one time there was a point where she did love him. But something went very sour. Maybe he was a drug addict. Maybe he was a gambling addict or something. Maybe their relationship had started at love and gotten so toxic that she felt the only way out was murder. But then when she did it, she remembered what they had before it all went bad. And that's her reaction. That is this deeper buried pattern that nobody saw coming. But if you have the pieces there in place before the event, you set the seeds of that through the story. Even if it's like out of left field, completely crazy behavior, uh, the audience is going to accept it. All the reasoning is going to be there. All the pieces are going to fit. And also, you will have presented them with several little patterns, little puzzles that they will have solved through the way and even found points where they were wrong. But they're going to be delighted they were wrong. But if you can't give a good explanation at any point, or there's not at least the framework of an explanation somewhere in the story that they can dig up, it doesn't have to be in their face. It can be buried in there in little little pieces, you know. It, it's just got to be like somebody somewhere needs to read the thing and say, no, 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 you missed it. Go back. Look, look at this part right here, right? And they go back and read it and they say, oh. <laughs> then they go back and they read your book like three or four more times. Yeah, I love those part. books. That's but every part. time you read it, you're just like, wait a minute, that's yeah. what that dude was doing this whole time? And you have to read it again because now you know. And you those have to read favorite. it knowing. <laughs> Those are my favorite. Um, the the best writer that ever lived or will ever live is Gene Wolfe. Period. Out of out of anybody else, for me, it's going to be somebody different for everybody, right? Somebody else is going to be Hemingway. It'll be Steinbeck. It'll be Tolstoy or or whoever. Dostoevsky. Yeah. Right. Or it'll be uh, uh, Jane Eyre or any of these any of these greats, these powerhouses. But for me, it's Gene Wolfe, and it's because mm -hmm. he was the godfather of of this kind of writing and i am just a poor chinese knockoff <laughs> it's, it's i'm just this <laughs> shitty import that uh i would i would love to be one tenth as good as he ever was but now, i might have to settle for less josh do you do you figure all about those twists out before you write the scene or is this something where you'll write the scene, you get it done, and then you'll be like, wait a minute, why did my character do X? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, and then There's, you go back and change some details to make yeah, the, it. Yeah, I mean, just sometimes the characters will evolve uh, outside of what you've intended for them. They, they, You know, sometimes they just go in a different direction, and that's cool. Um, if, if it's working, you got to let it happen. Uh, the, I've I've seen often this this kind of debate going hey do you plot or are you a pantser you know um and i think the answer is is always all of the above it's got to be everything you've got to be able to do both and you've got to be able to shift between both comfortably so that the story can be what it needs to be um so for me uh how much i'll plot a story is really just based on how complicated it's going to be um some stories that i write are a little bit easier i don't have to put too much thought into keeping everything straight there's other stories that are just a, a nightmare. <laughs> like the one that I'm writing right now, it kind of happens out of temporal order. And, and uh, I know I don't like to do anything easy for myself. Um, but you, you like for me, I like to kind of plot everything up to a point where I know, OK, I could sit down and start writing this. And I usually don't do the whole book at first. I usually do like the first, I, you know, I think of it in acts like first, second and third act. And I might, I might plot out the first act just in ridiculous detail, right? And then the second act might just be, you know, just kind of headings for chapters. Like, I know this needs to happen here. I need, and then the third act, I, I, it might just be something like they kiss, you know? It's, it's, but as you go, it's, it's kind of like you're, you're writing the story in front of yourself as you're going. So it's like, I've, I've written all this out in like fully uh, formed prose. And then after that, it's like, uh, if you ever played Dungeons and Dragons or, or any kind of tabletop games with some buddies and like you tell the guy, okay, I want to open up that door. What's behind that door? You can't open it. Well, why not? I use my magic spell to open the door. 
You finally open the door. What's in there? Nothing. You see white. Now keep <laughs> going, right? I didn't think of that part of the world yet. So the story is like that. It's like out there somewhere, I know something's happening, but I right. kind of leave it open. I know what has to happen. I know where I have to go, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to tie myself down to anything yet because I don't want to have to go and undo all that. If, if things evolve to a point where it's like, oh, this story wants to be something else, hmm. uh, you know, um, commune ended up being like that. Uh, it, it kind of turned into something new. Uh, when I was working on the second draft of the first book, I, I had kind of a general idea of what I wanted to do with that story. But then when I was right, I was doing the second draft of that first book and it suddenly like everything just clicked into place in my head. And I said, Oh, I, I know exactly what this needs to be. Um, and I then, love when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's some, sometimes you're kind of working on a book and you think, I don't know if this, this is gonna, if it's going to resonate when I, when I put it out there and people read it uh, again, you always want to feel like that. You don't ever want to feel like, Oh, I know what I'm doing. I just, I just wrote a thing uh, recently over the weekend and, and I'm uh, because of the material, I'm a little, it, it's a little out of my comfort zone for what I tend to write because it's much more, um, it's much more feminine and emotional. So I'm, I'm taking it to my wife and I'm like, I need you to read this. Does this, is, is this honest? Does this feel, does this feel true? And, she read it and she's like, yeah, that, that chapter, it was great. The one after that, oh my God. She's like, this is terrible. You got to redo this. And I, you got to keep people around you that are like that. You got to, you got to have somebody who's, who can tell you that's, that's crap <laughs> because, um, and you got to be able to take it. Well, you know how to use it. It's weird now because like, I'm, I'm getting kind of to a point now where it's, I don't, I don't know if anybody ever expects to get there as a writer where it's like you get some books out there and a lot of people like them and, and uh, they start getting ideas about who you are. Uh, they get ideas about who you are as a writer or, or what your stories are always going to be. Um, and you can't really let yourself get tied into that. It was like Lauren, when you were saying earlier, well, I'll, I'll say that here's your serious commune and your, po- your genre is post-apocalyptic. And I was like, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and all my, like a lot of my readers, um, I know they probably wish that I would do more of that, but I can't, I, I can't, I can't just keep writing the same thing. I can't, right. I, if I, if I had to write nothing but like commune books or whatever, and that was like, all I think I'd quit. I just, I'd just be an engineer and, and that's it. I'm fine. Um, the fun, right. The fun that keeps you going. Yeah. But I, <laughs> and I kind of lost it, my train of thought, what I was saying. I do that sometimes, but oh well. I do it all the time. I will yeah. literally forget what we're talking about mid-show. No oh, worries. I was, yeah, I was talking about plotting and all that. Well, the point that I was really t- just trying to make was that, um, you know, all the all the techniques that we talk about all the time, the plotting, the writing by the seat of your pants, the the tenses and all that. These are all just tools and gimmicks. Um, just as much as whatever software it is you decide to write with, you know, like oh, with, people ask me that and I don't know why they ask me that. What do you, you use Scrivener? Do you use Word? Like, if, if, if you want to write it bad enough, you'll, you'll do it on a cocktail napkin. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you got tools. Don't, don't worry about tools. It's unimportant. Um, don't worry about what mechanics you have to or techniques you have to put in your story. It's got to have this. It's it, th- this is the thing I'm supposed to do. You, at any given point, if if you're writing something, and and you can feel that it's correct, like you know it's correct, it's the thing that you want to read the most. That's probably the best you can do for yourself, right? Mm-hmm. As an artist, you write the thing that you most want to read. That doesn't mean that that's the thing that that your audience most wants to read. So sometimes you make a kind of a compromise. You try to second guess yourself and say, okay, well, I think this is kind of a crowd pleaser and I'll put it in there to, to make my audience happy. Um, and you have to make a decision how far you want to do that. Uh, how, how fluid is your integrity when you're writing stuff? Sometimes you think, oh, it's fine. I'll put a little fun thing in, but sometimes it doesn't have, it doesn't have the place in the story. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to know when to leave things out, when to add things in, even when other people are, are 
you know, with the best of intentions telling you what it should be or what it's got to be, or this is what sells, or this is, this is what everybody wants to read. This is what they want to see on the cover. This is what they want in the title. This is the character they want. This is the plot. Fuck them. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta write the thing that you want to read first. And after that, whatever's left it takes care of itself. <laughs> you know? So I, I know Things are helpful with like when you get stuck, like when you're, when you're looking at your plot and you're not sure where the plot should go next, then a tool can help you get to the next step. Well, if you, if you know the end you're shooting for, uh, it, it at least gives you a, a target to aim mm -hmm. at. You know? Yeah. Um, th that's like for me, I, I kind of like to, I, li I like to write a story in different directions. Um, I like to start from the end and work my way back, and then start from the beginning and work my way forward. And I'll do that a couple of times in both directions. Not really uh, to to heavy detail. It's not like I'm I'm you know the crazy guy with the threads across the wall and everything. But I, I you know every once in a while I might have uh, I try different techniques for different books. Uh, one time I took a bunch of post-it notes and I just wrote story beats all over it, and then I just started arranging them on the wall. I made it as modular as I could and I just kind of stuck them there. And it wasn't they weren't like generic story beats. They were specifically to the story. They right. were things that I knew had to happen in the story but it wasn't sequential at all it was just like okay um character starts here i want him to end here and this is going to be the climax up here so okay what events takes this psychology from here to there and then i have to just you know kind of figure out how that works right and if you can connect the dots then you can do it this way it works uh it, it feels a little tinker toys at first but when you put more and more layers on it as you go, it, it fleshes out. It's, it starts to feel pretty real. The, the book that I'm writing right now, it's, I did it just this way. Uh, and it, it seems to be working. Uh, the wife so far has said that I haven't screwed it up yet. And I'm at about 125,000 words. I think I got maybe another 30 to go before I get close to the uh, end on that one. It's, it's like I said, I'm long winded. So, yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if it's a romance. Uh partially, yes, it is. It's uh nice. it's uh about high school students. Uh it's 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 strange. <laughs> I'll be following your Facebook group to see when it comes out. Okay. I well I, I think it's gonna come out next year. Uh we've got uh some talks through my publisher to, to have it produced through various channels. And I don't want to say too much about it because I think there's certain things that haven't been signed yet, but it should be pretty good when it comes out. I think it'll do all right. I don't know if my audience is going to accept it because it's so far off the reservation from what I typically do, but. Well, if you're not willing to take it. chances, <laughs> you can always yeah. write another book, you know, <laughs> yeah, you always right. write another story. Yeah. So we are a little bit over. Are there any last minute um, tips or anything about characterization that you want to share with the audience? Also where people can find you. Yeah. One thing I was thinking about earlier that we didn't really come around to that I think could be helpful is, is um, like Steve mentioned my dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, so with dialogue, you want to, um, you want it to stand out. You want it to pop. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is if, if somebody speaks a certain way, I have them talk that way. I have them write that way. So I'm really uh, loose with my apostrophes and so forth and how I'll butcher a word. I don't care if when I'm in dialogue, I don't care if words are spelled right. I care if they sound right when you read them. So I'll do that. Uh, and then each person, I like them to have a, a tick when they speak, like a verbal tick that, that I can fall back on. Uh, the best line of dialogue is the one that you can read and know who's saying it without their name by it. You know, if, if I don't need it to say John said or Jane said, that's good dialogue because I just know who that character is when they're speaking. So you can do that in a lot of ways. You can have like this little lexicon of phrases that they always fall back on. When I wrote uh, Gibbs, a Marine character, I never served in the military, 
So I had like a whole cheat sheet just full of, of uh, marine manner, mannerisms, uh, sayings, colloquialisms, slang terms. It's just like every, right there, right next to the screen whenever I needed it. And uh, I learned where to use them appropriately so I wasn't uh, you know, showing myself to be a fool. But now when I get people in the service that write to me, they tell me, man, I can't believe you didn't serve. I, that, that was the most accurate depiction of a Marine I've ever seen in a book. That makes me feel really good. That's it's kind of like, I, you know, when I was writing a military character, I wanted to do it in such a way that people who had actually served didn't feel like I was uh, making light of what they'd done. I wanted them to know that I'd taken it seriously. So there's that. With Jake, uh, he has this habit of saying yes a lot after the end of sentences, but only at certain times. It's when he wants you to agree with him. So mm -hmm. if... if uh, if you say, well, well, we'll be making the cake tonight, right? That sounds like I'm asking you for your confirmation. But if I say, we're going to make the cake tonight, yes? That's combative. That's aggressive, right? That's, that's like, you're going to agree with me. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the idea behind Jake, or the way he presents himself in the books, is that it's, it's, he's, he's at the head of this um, almost... Uh, egalitarian society where it's like everybody just kind of picks it. It's almost like, you know, that's why I wrote a commune, right? Cause it's kind of like this little communist society that they've uh, kind of created in the mountains. And uh, it, it's, it's always this idea that it's like, Oh, we, you know, we're just in this together and we all agree to do things. But then every once in a while, when he really wants something to happen, and it's subtle, but he's, he's, well, we're going to do this. Yes. We're going to have a discussion about this later. Yes. And there's no, there's no arguing with that. It's like, yes, you know, he's kind of Jedi mind tricking you. But then the other character who is uh, supposed to be like his his anti, right? Uh, you've got Jake and then you have this character, Clay. Um, and for as, as different as everybody wants to say they are, they're really different sides of the same coin. So Clay has the same tick, but it's not it's not aggressive and authoritarian. It's, huh. When he when he says something, he's he's always going, huh? And, you know, we, we, are we going to make those cakes today? We're, we're going to make those cakes, huh? You know, he he doesn't like that. And it's kind of the same thing. It's he's he's wanting your agreement that that what they're trying to do is right. But I also want this guy Clay to sound unsure. I don't want him to sound like he knows what he's doing or that he's in control because I don't want my reader to think that that's what's going on with him. I, I want them to kind of feel like he's making this stuff up as he goes. And what's fun about that for me is that between the two characters, they're both extremely authoritarian. Um, they do it in different ways, though. Uh, you know, Clay's got this kind of idea that he needs to do it publicly so that people can see him at it and know that he's not uh, he's not trying to, to get away with any underhanded stuff. You know, he, he wants to, whatever he's doing, he's always worried about the social acceptance of his community. So whenever they're uh, the oh, spoilers, uh, it, whenever they're um, like like deliberating over a case with somebody in the community, it's like we got to punish this guy. His first question question isn't is he guilty? Is he innocent? It's like what's the standing in the community? Do people like him or or what do they think about this guy? Because he's always worried about what's what's the social implication going to be based on this decision. Whereas Jake. He's authoritarian too, but he's he's always wanting things to be under the radar. He wants people to feel like they made the decision that he gave them. So you do that in dialogue, and you can get that sense. If I if I uh, if I request your agreement, but I tell you yes when I do it, that feels a certain way. Right. And if I if I request your agreement, but I go huh, or that that feels another way. And people have that when they interact with each other every day. People speak in certain ways. Certain people say certain phrases over and over again. Certain people stutter at the start of their sentence. Every sentence they start at that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And then they finish their sentence. Certain people, when they come walking without even hearing them, you know who it is. Or not hearing them, but not without even seeing them. You know? It's like if you're sitting in a room somewhere and you hear somebody coming down the hall, sometimes you can hear the footsteps and you know who that is coming. People have their own walk. Everything that people do, it's like their own special fingerprints. So the more of that that you can figure out how to inject into that personality on the page 
and not so it's like obvious like look here's the thing i'm gonna dangle in front of you and you know you, you slip it in there you do it in dialogue you do it in observations that characters have uh, other characters have about your your focus so that you don't have to just sit there and tell the reader because the reader doesn't want you to tell them anything they don't want to be told they want to see it and i have nothing left to say <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, we were talking about morality. I feel like your morality is between you as the author and the reader. Yes. Like you've got, you've got a bargain set up and you're going to fulfill that bargain for your reader. You're going to be true to them. I'm not allowed to cheat the reader, no. Right. And I'm also not allowed to give the reader any answers uh, that they're requesting for the story. They they ask me all the time. It's like, well, what happened here? What, what did you intend here? What was your meaning here? And I, I, I have to tell them, I, I can't tell you. Hmm. Because if I tell you that, I'm robbing you of, of that process yourself. Again, it's not, it's not about the idea that I had when I wrote it. It's the experience that the reader has when they consume the work. So that's a very personal thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to insert myself into that process. That's, that's for hmm. the reader to have. It's not, I have no place in it. And and from everything that we've been talking about, ways that I'm concluding uh, that Josh does this is, you know, you you have a solution, but it needs to have a setup. Yeah. And, you know, it needs to have a, a satisfying, this is what's going on. This is obviously what's going to happen. But sometimes you can you can twist that up a little bit. You can give it a deeper meaning by adding layers to okay. to the reasoning behind why a character is doing something and the more um, and the more subtle you can be the better it's going to be even if even if a hint that explains some action is buried all the way in the first book and and the event is later in the fourth it's it's fine as long as it happens somewhere within the start and the ending of the story spread across volumes or whatever if it's in there you've you've done your job and then it's you know it it, it depends on the kind of game you want to play with your reader. I like playing uh, a bit of give and take with my reader, right? So I, I'm okay with them coming away, scratching their head a little. Not too much, because there there is the main idea that I want them to to pull apart from, from the reading. So I don't, I don't want to just be a total asshole and just obfuscate everything. But there are certain things that I'm okay if they don't get it the first time around. And I'm okay if they never get it. That's okay. It doesn't hurt the story. But I want them to be able to come back at some point, read it again, and if they see it, they'll know that I didn't I didn't leave them hanging. You know? And the more I can do that and, and the more my readers have an experience with that, they'll start to understand that they're playing a different game when they're reading my stuff. They're not just reading something passively to to get a story and and okay the a, B, and then C happen, and it's over, yay. They'll start to get, oh, if if I look a little harder, I'll be able to find more things in here. Hmm. And and that's that's an agreement you make, you know? It's like, if, if, if you're going to make them think something's in there, for God's sake, put it in there. <laughs> it's, don't be a jerk about it. <laughs> yeah, all right, so at the end of the day, be true to your characters, be true to the, the characterizations that they are. Um, who are, who were they in the past? What builds them up to the point that you that you are starting them off at, mm -hmm. and how are you getting them to the end of the story? Um, build in the layers, and Dag Nabbit, if you put a gun in Act One, make the fuckers shoot in Act Four. Chekhov's <laughs> gun, very good. Yes. All righty. So thank and you so always, much for coming on the show, Josh. Write something that scares the hell out of you. That too. Yes. Oh, that's another good point. I almost forgot that. If it's making you uncomfortable, push through. Yeah, because it could probably, be hugely important. It's probably good. And as Lauren is reminding me, uh, sticker time. Who do we have left in in the chat right now? Because we are thirty minutes over. I am subjectively and totally randomly. Who is in the chat? Anyone out there? Anyone? I know. I, I believe Shadow's there's in there because I just saw seven people watching. There's seven people watching. Who are you? Seven people that are watching <laughs> us right now. Someone get a sticker. Anyone say something? Shadow already had a sticker a couple weeks ago. Alan V. Chessman. He was the first one to respond. There we go. You want a sticker? You need to contact Lauren. And no, over here. Woo! Facebook PM me, and then I'll send you your sticker. 
There you go, Alan V. Chessman. Congratulations, golf clap. Golf clap. All righty. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show, Josh. I My brain is, is really spinning. Like, There's a lot of things that you're saying that I already do, but there are so many other things that I hadn't even even thought to think about and and all the pieces coming together it's know. delicious it's glorious and i'm going to eat it all up spit it back on the page okay. and to <laughs> everyone in the live chat youtube viewers podcast listeners thank you so much for hanging out with us make sure to subscribe hit the little like button ding the bell let us know what you thought about the show in the comments and as always join us next week next week next week we're going to talk about some reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Good night, guys. Good night. <laughs>